So again, it's Patrick's first time. A little bit of encouragement. Three, two, one. Thank you. Um, so I was thinking, like, uh, what, like, I'm giving the last speech in the main room, right? So, like, that's kind of negative position, like, like to be in, right? So, always think positively. Like, on the other hand, I'm giving the closing keynote of the conference, right? So, that's kind of good. So basically, what I'm going to try to do is try to learn you something, uh, try to learn you, teach you something interesting about property-based testing. It's not going to be a fully-fledged uh, tutorial on this topic. So let's talk about tests. Let's suppose we've got the following add function signature. Takes two ints, and then in returns another int. So how would you approach testing it? Like, you can go on and on and just write test cases like this one, add some numbers, expect uh, another number, add some zero inside, negative numbers, big numbers, right? You can go on and on and like, on like this. You can write 10, 50, 100 of t tests like this. You can you know, improve it by using, let's say, table-driven tests or whatever, right? And let's say that those tests, all the tests pass and they, they pass for one, two, three weeks, whatever your, your project lives on. But what if the implementation looked like this? And you've never thought about this. Never, no one really cared to put a test like this, right? So you've used, maybe for, for you know, by accident, someone wrote, written a test using Y as seven, but you didn't consider seven, X being seven, right? So this is always like, you know, contrived example, but I bet that at least there's at least one part of your code base at work or whatever that has some kind of code like this that you, you never know when it's going to fire back at you. So how can we test addition in other means? Like, how can we think about it, uh, thinking it from another perspective, right? So let's think about its properties. Everyone, I, I presume everyone in this room is like primary school knowledge, knows property, uh, properties of addition, right? There's three of them. We know that addition is pro, uh, commutative, commutative, associative, and it has the, uh, it has the additive identity property, right? So let's try to define those in pseudocode. That would be for the commutativity, you just put two random numbers, you, you use the add function, and then you use it with the reverse order of parameters. It should always, it should always be equal, right? You use the additive identity property, and you add to any random number you want, zero, and you should get the very same number back. And then you've got the associativity, so you add three numbers, and then you reverse the other operations, and it should always be the same, right? Like, taking aside like overflows, underflows, and stuff like this, but that should always work. So that's exactly where property-based testing kicks in. And what I would like to show you are examples in this presentation using rapid check uh, property-based testing uh, framework, which has been done by Emil uh, Ericsson at Spotify. Uh, they have found several interesting bugs in their Spotify player uh, using this. Uh, mostly related to shuffling, uh, shuffling songs and playlists and stuff like this. It's been greatly inspired by uh, QuickCheck and Haskell, which has been in the environment, uh, in, the in Haskell ecosystem for several years now. So let's, so let's take the, the pseudocode that we've used to define uh, uh, addition properties and then just rewrite it as in C++ code. So using rapid check, it will, you, it will be more or less like this. Take, uh, take the RC check uh, function, put a test definition, and then just put the lambda almost as it would be like plain English. Uh, so we co almost copy up the, the properties that we defined, and then we put it in the lambda. And the, ma the place where magic kinks in, it's, it's where we define the parameters to the lambda. The framework does... Uh, magical automatic random uh, parameter generations for it for each each of the test invocation. So we use that, we use all of those properties for the implementation that we've seen, and we're gonna see more or less output like this showing us that 
we have a, uh, we have a problem in our impl implementation. As you might see, there is the seven in the first place in the first parameter that has been caught as a problem. Going back, we might go and fix the implementation that we've seen back there, and then we're going to see the successful uh, successful uh, tests passing. Uh, what you might see in the slide is that the, the, each of the tests has been run 100 times. And if that's a reasonable default of the framework, you can configure it to your needs. You can also observe the seed, which was used to uh, uh, randomly generate numbers. So if you want to reproduce that, you can always use the seed if you've seen a failing test case in your CI or whatever you, you're using. Uh, RapidCheck has a lot of configuration options. Google test or boost test uh, integration, one of them. If you want to use it with Google test, just replace the macros that you're using from Google test, uh, shove, uh, shove uh, rapid checks macros in there, and then add a third parameter, which would be the list of the parameters that, you would like, that you'd like to have randomly generated for you for each, each test generation. What I'm using here is the rapid checks in ring generator, which basically Re, uh, returns uh, when the referenced it returns a uh, uh, number which is in it, between first and second and then I'm just checking whether it's in, uh, indeed in the range and then we're getting like familiar output from from Google test together with the C that I've mentioned before uh, one of the biggest features of property-based testing frameworks are uh, is shrinking functionality which allows which allows humans to reason about the test output. So having random numbers and one random, uh, random types being generated by, uh, by the random system, you're going to have, fa if you have a failed test case, you're going to have uh, tremendously diff like really different types and really different values that it's hard to reason about them. Just li like as in, in this test case, you're, you're having a test that is called all numbers in vector or have desired va value, and you have just a bunch of random numbers that you have that you have no clue what they might be and what the test uh, re uh, requires from it. But after shrinking, it will look more or less like this, and it would still fail your test. That's real. That's way easier to reason what might be actually in there. It, it's still like in the add function, it still might be a contrived example, but th there's probably a lot of uh, examples in your code base that it might be useful. And this particular test was just testing whether all of those numbers were less than 100. And you can see that it matched the fifth parameter uh, that was the only one that was higher than, than 100. It, it, make it made it smaller up to 100 and then the other ones which were not relevant made it zeros it didn't shrink the it didn't shrink the vector size because it was important that it was the the, the concrete size was left untouched the other one is reproducible failures and the c that it's used to to run tests just as you've seen before as i've mentioned uh, but there is also another feature that allows that on in each failed test case, you're going to get output in the end that, that tells you that you can reproduce your test with RC params and the parameters that has been used to, to launch the test case. And what's really convenient uh, when you use this, this particular uh, uh, environment is uh, uh, vari environment and variable is that if you, if you have like thousands of tests or hundreds of thousands of tests for your, uh, for your system, and then it takes, I don't know, one minute, five minutes, whatever, two hours to run it, you're gonna, running your test with this flag are, is going to just reproduce the failed test case that you had. And that's really convenient if you want to, if you want to follow the flow of the failed test case. More of those, you, with RapidCheck, you can, you can write your own uh, user-defined type generators. And what's really convenient is that you have built-in STL support, which makes it really easy. When you write, when you write uh, user, your, your types T uh, generator, you get, uh, you'll get STL vector, STL list of your type T generators for free. It's like built in the framework. Uh, you get configurable number of tests to run, whatever you want to run. If 100 is not enough, just put a million in there, whatever you want to run. There is lots, of, lots and lots and lots of configuration options that you can use with this one. 
So the, for, as a conclusion, I would like to mention that just try to think about your tests as fellow human beings. Don't try to think about them as input-output pairs. It would be disgusting to think about fellow coworkers in terms of input-output pairs, right? Just think about them, think about their properties and conditions that should hold throughout the whole test execution. And some of the examples that I've written here and many more are, is, are, ava are available on my GitHub. You can just download them. And as probably you've seen Bartex, uh, Bartex talk, it's just one command to run them. There's no magical, uh, magical build commands that you have to use. And that's basically, basically it. You can check out those references. There's a very nice talk by Scott uh, Vlashin about, uh, I believe, F-sharp's uh, quick check implementation, which tells a really nice story, which I have to admit I've been inspired by. So that's basically it. Thanks a lot. Patrick Małek.